Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan McRae. It's Science Week and this is the Festival of Farming and Food. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, series of events all this week and I'll be joining you for all of them. Uh, all of the events are free with thanks to Sponsored Science Foundation Ireland and Chagask. And the only thing that we would ask from you is that you let us know if you liked it uh, by answering the survey that you'll get an email about uh, after the event. We're going to be here for the next hour uh, chatting to scientists from the National Botanic Gardens uh, and we'll also be hearing from uh, researchers from the Do Chagas Horticultural Development Department. Uh, Chagas runs the College of Horticulture in the National Botanic Gardens and a horticultural research program at the Ashtown Food Research Centre. Uh, you can also ask questions live now in the Q&A and we will get to as many of those as we can throughout the hour. Please though, do let us know where you're from or if you're from a school, what school you're from, we'd love to give you a shout out. Um, the National Botanic Gardens in Dublin, if you haven't visited, it's a beautiful place uh, to spend some time, but it's also really important for the education of, far, of, of gardeners. It's important for um, conservation and and also learning about plants. Um, staff from the gardens and Chagask are here today to talk to us about their work, their research, and uh, what they do in terms of sustainability. But first of all, we have a video to play to you because we've visited the National, National uh, Botanic Gardens and uh, we want to see what our panelists have to say about their work. So watch this and we'll be back in a few minutes to have our panel discussion. We're here in the National Herbarium and I'm Colin Kelleher, the keeper of the National Herbarium. You might wonder what exactly is a herbarium and really they're just collections or stores of plant, uh, dead plant specimens, so dried and pickled. There's about 3,000 uh, herbaria across the world and they together they store over 390 million specimens. The National Herbarium here in Glasnevin is relatively small. We contain about 600,000 specimens. Uh, although it's small, internationally we're the largest and most comprehensive uh, herbarium, hence we're called the National Herbarium. And in a way, uh, with that 600,000 specimens, we're actually the most biodiverse area in Ireland in terms of plant diversity. Uh, we have 400 species per square metre on average. However, these plants are all dead, as I said, they're dried and they're pickled. So what use are 600,000 specimens and indeed 390 million worldwide? Well, there's a huge amount of use uh, that you can put a herbarium specimen to. One of the most obvious is we have on the label, we have when it was taken and where it was taken and then by who and then what it actually is. But the when and the where are absolutely key. They tell us where a plant was and when it was, um, when it occurred. So we can build up an understanding of where all the plants are in Ireland or indeed worldwide. And we can then use that data to assess changes over time. Uh, we can then go into even more detail by looking at the structures of the plants to see how they interact with the environment. And then we can go a step further and we can actually extract DNA from the plant material and look at genetic changes over time or just genetic differences between species. One particular use that herbarium specimens are put to is naming plants. So uh, if you go to your local, um, local woodland, local grassland, you're identifying plants and you're looking at a guidebook, the names in those guidebooks will link back to what's called a type specimen. It's a little sort of complicated, but in essence, uh, it's just a fancy specimen and they, they come in these pink or these red folders. And the red folders are deliberate to make them stand out. And really what they are, are the first specimen that was named. Okay, so when you uh, think of those names that you have from your, your guidebook, each of those names will go back to, we, we would call them standard bearers. So these are the original specimen that that name derived from. So it's like the biological equivalent to a meter stick or a, a kilogram. You know, that's the standard for measurement and these are the standards for the names. 
And the cool thing about uh, a herbarium is that you can compare all these specimens. So if I go out and I say I've found a new species, then people will want to know, well, what have you compared it to? I can't just name something randomly. I have to compare it to closely related species and even closely related genera. And so that's where a herbarium really comes in. You can then, as you see here, we have all these specimens laid out. These are all from the genus uh, Ranunculus, which are our buttercups. And so we have the terrestrial buttercups over here and the aquatic buttercups over here. And we can easily then take these specimens and compare them side by side. It's much more difficult to do that in the field when, you're, when everything is seasonal and you're dependent on not only weather conditions but season. Uh, and things in flower and fruit, but when they're captured in a herbarium specimen, that is a physical snapshot of a particular time, a particular place. And we can then use that to assess variation over time and then uh, improve classification of plants. In terms of sustainability, uh, one of the major threats uh, for biodiversity would be invasive species. So these are species that are introduced accidentally or even deliberately, and then they take over the niche of a native species or a native suite of species. And the herbarium records are really instrumental in us combating invasive species. They can tell us where the species first occurred in, in Ireland, for example, and then how it's moving across uh, the island. We can have like a thousand bramble specimens. What use is a thousand bramble specimens? Well, they have uh, all the data associated with them in terms of where they were collected and when they were collected. And we can use that and then use the physical specimen to assess their interaction with their environment. One classic example is looking at uh, phenology. Phenology is the, the timing of biological events, so we can look at, say, flowering and fruiting. The bramble specimens were used for that, and they were used to show that, in fact, flowering has come uh, about a week earlier in the past 70 years. That's the herbarium specimens showing us how plants are interacting and basically giving us evidence for climate change. So what we're looking at here are uh, specimens of CP and it's uh, Lathyrus japonicus. This is a, quite a rare plant in Ireland and it forms these ephemeral populations on the coast. Uh, they pop up and some survive just a few years or even one season and then disappear. But again the cool thing about a herbarium specimen is that we can have a herbarium specimen of a population that no longer exists. So we have populations in Donegal, and in various places in Cork and Kerry that no longer exist today. And one of the things we did with these specimens is we extracted DNA out of the specimen. So these are plants that no longer exist, but we're interested in what was the genetic diversity over time and has it changed over time compared to what it is today. And we can only do that because we have the physical specimens from the past and we're able to extract the DNA out of them and analyze them. And this, the information from that genetic uh, analysis then can feed into uh, conservation measures in order to uh, sustainably conserve this population into the future. And here we are in the laboratory. This is where we do the genetic analysis. And I'm going to let uh, Sam talk about uh, all the genetic analysis and the process of doing that. Hello, my name is Sam Belton and I'm a postdoctoral researcher based here in the lab in, in the herbarium. Um, so I'm currently working on a, a two-year project which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Uh, and basically what I'm doing uh, when I'm not in the lab is I'm out traveling around the country to different forest locations uh, and sampling our native tree species. So what we have here uh, are a number of different bags and each bag contains leaves. And so each bag here would have come from a different forest uh, location somewhere in Ireland. Each bag here contains uh, silica gel and the purpose of the silica gel is to preserve the leaves once they've been removed from the trees. Within each bag, there are sample envelopes uh, containing a few leaves, and each envelope comes from an individual tree. 
on the envelope we have written the the date uh, and a few other bits of information but importantly we have written down the gps coordinates for the individual tree so we can always go back to the forest if you want to go back and examine or re-extract or take material from uh, a, a tree that's particularly interesting as Colin would have explained earlier, we're not only analysing DNA from samples going back hundreds of years, we're also an analysing samples from DNA that we collect today in the field. One of the things that we do when we extract our DNA is we use the PCR technique. So PCR is the technique which is used to test for the presence of COVID-19 in saliva samples. And so what we can see here are the results of PCR reactions from two separate birch trees uh, and these are trees which would have looked identical to physically examine the leaves but when we look at the genetic level we can see that they are in fact two separate individuals. So far we've sampled nearly 2,000 trees from native woodland sites all across the country. When we've finished our DNA analysis and we've got an idea of the levels of genetic variation in our native woodland sites We'll be able to use that information to sustainably manage our forests into the future, which is going to be especially important um, when we consider climate change. Hi, my name is uh, Daryl Lupton and I'm, um, I am the curator here at the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland. Um, I've just taken up this role in February of this year um, after finishing a, a 10 year period in the Sultanate of Amman in Arabia, where I was head of the Botany and Conservation Department there at the newly formed Botanic Gardens. So as curator here at the gardens, I, I'm responsible for the living collections, of which we have in and around 15,000 registered, uh, documented, named and labelled plants within the collections. And that's what's a, that, that element about plants being labelled is one of the key um, elements uh, and characteristics of a Botanic Garden. Our collections are not just plants uh, and trees and shrubs and so on. Our collections are all data-based, Everything is labelled, including uh, information on where the plant has been collected from, including the plant family, including the plant's full name or cultivar name, if it's appropriate. So on, on top of the, the research work here and the conservation work that goes on in the gardens, uh, probably our most important uh, element is as a visitor facility. We, we have our plant collections are, are stunningly beautiful. We have collections from all over the world housed in this 50 acre site. So the visitor here can see plants from the tropics, from the Mediterranean, from alpine areas of the world, all within one area. And this is a very, very unique uh, experience for most people. We're very conscious of providing all the various uh, seasonal changes uh, for visitors. So in the summertime, when you visit the garden, you will see fantastic, really bright, colorful floral displays. And in the autumn, as the, as the plants die back and the leaves fall, you will be wowed by the, by the wonderful autumn color in the arboretum and across the trees and larger shrubs in the garden. Visitors are also encouraged to, to come back and to engage with the um, education staff here, whose role is to impart the importance of the Botanic Garden and the role of the Botanic Garden as an international uh, botanical institution. So visitors can not only take strolls in, in the gardens and enjoy the space and the collections, they can also get further and deeper involved in the history of the gardens. So the tours can show you elements of the history, they can show you elements of the important plant collections, that is plants that may be extremely rare around the world, or plants that were collected by very important botanists over the last several hundred years, um, to traditional plant uses. So tours are varied um, and they prove very, very popular with the public. So part of my role is to liaise with the education team uh, to ensure that visitors, when they're coming to the gardens, are being given the most uh, up-to-date information uh, and that the collections are being used to their fullest potential in terms of education and so on. Of course, one of the, one of the key elements at the garden here uh, and, and in the world in general is the, the idea of sustainability and that sustainable use of resources and where plants play a role in that. Uh, many of the products we use uh, in our daily lives are plant derived. So it's very, very important that we consider plants uh, as being uh, an integral part of a sustainable future. Uh, at the gardens, for example, in terms of planting, we're, we're conscious of climate change. Climate change predictions would, would indicate that we're going to get uh, drier summers, maybe increased rainfall or storminess. 
stormy periods. So we, we have to start considering our collections and how appropriate our collections are for the future. We certainly don't want to be growing uh, trees that require huge amounts of water during the summer. We can see from the last few years, we've had very, very dry periods. We want to move away from trees that are water hungry so we, we can reduce our water uh, output. Um, so with the selections of our trees and plantings going forward, we will be considering very carefully where they come from. So selecting trees, for example, from drier parts of the world, which are more evolved uh, for dealing with drier drought periods is something we need to consider. Also the use of energy in our buildings. Um, we are very conscious of, of the collections. Many of our collections are tropical or subtropical and they require heat during the winter and sometimes even during the summer. So we're, we're conscious about adapting our collections um, going forward that they don't require so much heat during the colder winter months. This is something that we see as is, is slightly unsustainable. Um, so we're very conscious of, of, of doing that. Also our use of pesticide. We have reduced the use of pesticide here enormously over the last 10 or 15 years or so, uh, where it was very commonplace in the past to just spray weed killer. We no longer do that. A lot of um, our control is done now mechanically. Uh, or we're using products that are environmentally safe. So all of these changes are happening now and will continue to happen in the future. Uh, and this is something that is driving uh, the garden's ethos. So since the garden was opened in 1795, it's had a long uh, association with training and education. And from the very early days of the garden where, where staff were trained and students were trained in agriculture, um, right up to the modern day when we have a whole range of horticultural courses here run by Chagosk, and the relationship we've had with Chagas has gone back many, many decades. And some of Ireland's best gardeners have come through the gardens here uh, under the Chagas program. We also have programs here of staff training, our own in-house continual professional development where staff have had the opportunities over the years to go and exchange programs to other international gardens to look at how practices are done in, for example, the UK, United States, Australia uh, and the tropics. So the National Botanic Gardens Glass Nevin and its sister garden, Kilmacurra, down in County Wicklow, are part of a much bigger international global partnership of botanic gardens. But Glasnevin sits within this program. And th this program is, is very, very beneficial for many reasons. One, we share information very easily with, with each other. We often share plant material. So plants that are very, very rare in the wild can be grown in one garden, but also can be distributed to other gardens. This is a, an excellent way of safe, safe keeping these plants that are um, largely threatened in the wild. We also have a, a very, very successful seed exchange program with many gardens around the world, particularly strong ties with European gardens in that sense. So our staff here will regularly collect seed, particularly in the autumn, make full lists of our seeds that are available. And these botanic gardens from around the world can contact us and we will send them that seed. And likewise, we will also look at other gardens uh, internationally. We'll say we are very interested in growing this species. If you have seed or vegetative cutting material, could you please send it on to us? And generally this works very well and we are allowed to develop our collections, broaden the diversity of our collections through exchanging seed and cutting material from gardens around the world. Also, we are very much involved in the development of conservation uh, policies in terms of um, plant conservation programs internationally. Botanic gardens form a very, very important part of that program for plant conservation globally. Uh, and the Botanic Gardens here at Glasnevin has not only fed into the National Biodiversity Plan for Ireland, but has also fed into similar programs around the world and continues to do so. Many of our staff here are very active in, in these areas. So I mentioned uh, earlier about uh, rare and uh, threatened plants, enigmatic plants. Well, I, I don't think there's anything any more enigmatic or emblematic plant than this one I'm standing beside here. This is a, a cycad, Encephalartus woodii, and this plant was first discovered in the late, in the late 1890s in KwaZulu-Natal in Durban in South Africa. The plant only came from a number of individuals, and this plant was donated to Glasnevin Botanic Gardens in 1905. And the plant has moved around uh, from the Great Palm House here in the gardens to the Curvilinear Range next door and back again. Uh, but it's been sitting here for 116 years, and this year, for the first time, it has produced four cones. And what makes this very, very exciting is that this plant is extremely rare, effectively extinct in the wild. So plants exist only in botanic gardens. So far, only male cones have been produced globally in the botanic garden collections where it exists. 
And unfortunately, though it did cone this year, what we're looking at here are male cones. So although uh, Encephalartus woodii at the National Botanic Gardens turns out after 116 years to reveal itself as a male, all is not lost. What we, what we will do here is we will take a section or we will take a whole cone, one of the four, um, when it's matured, and we will preserve that in the, in the scientific collection here. One for our own records and second for maybe public engagement and so on. The other thing we can do is we can collect pollen once pollen is produced from the plant and we can store that pollen and freeze it and keep it uh, active and viable for a very, very long time. So if a female plant ever did turn up uh, in the wild or in another botanic garden, we would have viable pollen in which we could donate and try to cross fertilize and produce seed. This would be really a, a, an incredible uh, feat from botanic gardens. And, and this represents really uh, what, what botanic gardens do. We are at the essence of conservation. We conserve very, very rare species, Encephalartus woodii being possibly the rarest of them all. We've made incredible advances in science and the way we're able to produce food. Here we are in Chagask Ashtown in our glass house facility, essentially our outdoor growing lab. We're able to manipulate and control the indoor environmental conditions using screening, using heating, and that means we can grow crops all year round. There is a whole host of exciting research going on at the moment. My role focuses on sustainable horticulture and this extends to thinking about how we can use resources more efficiently, how we can use ecosystem goods and services in the way we produce food, and how we can reduce waste and loss in the system. One of the projects I work on is helping growers move towards more sustainable forms of packaging. We're helping growers, like tomato growers, move away from using traditional plastics to the use of starch-based plastics which are more environmentally sustainable. We've made incredible strides in growing food, driven by advances in science. The process of automation, sensing technology, digitization, and soilless growing media means we can grow crops year round, indoors, and even in urban environments. We have a lot of physical infrastructure to help us carry out our research, like research labs, glass houses, orchards, and land to produce the crops. What we have here is the first of its kind in Ireland, a 12.2 meter insect suction trap passively capturing insects while they fly. Many insects, like aphids, are pests to our crops. We can test the insects for the presence of virus and bacteria. We can then inform farmers about the presence of these insects which transmit many viruses to their crops and affect yield. Growers are already finding ways to reduce fertilizer and pesticide inputs, and they're finding ways to switch to the use of biological-based products. Waste streams are being recycled more efficiently and we're getting particularly good at this. Although sometimes these changes are costly for growers to make, we're seeing more and more growers adopting these sustainable practices. Sustainability is pervasive and really everything we do now is contributing to this goal. This year, Chagas launched its sustainability strategy. There is also a weekly seminar series called the Signpost Series and this disseminates research from within Chagask and across Ireland. The Chagask website is an excellent source of information and two things may be particularly interesting to people watching. Tea Research is our magazine published quarterly. It presents the latest research for a non-scientific audience. We also have Chagask's Walsh Scholarship Programme which supports researchers to carry out graduate degrees. With the increase in digitization and automation, increasingly non-traditional routes like computer science and engineering are also offering pathways into horticulture. Very good. Uh, okay, well, thanks to, to everyone who took part in the video. Um, and thanks to our panelists who are now gonna join me and uh, talk about some of the ideas that we heard uh, and about horticulture and sustainability. If you have any questions, get them in now uh, in the Q&A uh, part just below the screen. We'd love to hear from you. Remember to tell us where you're from and what school you're from if you're from a school. So we're joined by Dr. Daryl Lupton, uh, who is the curator of the National Botanic Gardens in Ireland. Dr. Colin Kelleher, you saw there, keeper of the National Herbarium. Um, we have 
uh, Dr. Leo Walsh, who finished the video there, research officer in the horticultural department uh, of Chagask. And uh, we also have Sam Belton, who's a PhD researcher at Chagask, whose research is in uh, gen genetic diversity of trees. Uh, John Mahern is the college principal in the College of Immunity and Horticulture, uh, and he uh, is in the video and he'll also be uh, uh, getting all of your questions and sending them through. So get your questions into us now. Um, you can also use the hashtag best farm food. Um, but first, uh, let's go to you, Dara. Um, th this is such an interesting job, and I, I was really, really interested in uh, seeing this really rare plant. And it sort of reminded me of the sort of the, the, the panda problem that we had maybe a couple of decades ago, where, where pandas were, were um, sort of disappearing and we just couldn't get them to mate. Um, tell me, how, uh, how, uh, um, how many of these rare plants do you have in the, um, in the National Botanic Gardens? Well, we, we, hi, Jonathan. Um, we, we have many, several hundred plants, uh, extremely rare plants in the collections, uh, in the living collections, um, but nothing quite as enigmatic as Encephalartus woodii. I mean, it, it originally came from such a small number of individuals, mm. and it's been sitting here for, like I said in the video, 116 years, uh, and, you know, yet it's, it's a male, unfortunately. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we do, we do have quite a lot of rare plants, but nothing quite as... Uh, uh, eye-catching or as emblematic as the Cephalaris woodia. Uh, I might, I might, I'm sure we'll have some questions about that, but m maybe um, you, you might tell us a little bit about how you got into horticulture and your role at the, Na the National Botanic Gardens. Sure. Um, well, I originally started studying horticulture here at the gardens in the mid-90s. I was on the then um, Chagas Amenity Horticulture Diploma, which was from 95 to 98. Um, during my middle year, I went to the UK where I worked for the RHS and I was very much turned on to the uh, science of taxonomy. That's the classification of plants. Yeah. So coming back uh, to finish my final year uh, at Glasnevin, I then went on to Trinity in Dublin to study botany. And I did a four year degree there at Trinity. Uh, I didn't have enough of the student life after 17 years, so I decided I'd stay on for after seven years. So I decided I'd stay on for another four. So I completed a PhD there um, in 2007, came back to Glasnevin then, where I was working with Colum in the herbarium. Um, but all the time, uh, the, the connection with horticulture has been very, very strong. And it's been a very, very useful to, to have a botany degree with a horticultural uh, qualification is a very, very, very useful combination. And this was something that became very useful to, to me when I worked in Oman. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the video, I've just come back from Oman, uh, where I'd spent 10 years managing the botany department. And being such a young garden, the collection and the cultivation of plants was, was very, very important. And I've no doubt that the combination of having both of those qualifications was what got me the job in the first place. So I'm back here now, uh, enjoying it very much. And, and what draws you to horticulture as a career? What, what is it that you love about it? Well, before I started studying horticulture, I would say I was wandering in the wilderness, wondering what I would do. Um, I had traveled extensively around Europe and, and in the Middle East in my early 20s, and I found myself being drawn to uh, jobs where I was happened to be working with plants. This could be uh, greenhouses in the Negev Desert in Israel, or it could have been in, in rose growers in, in Amsterdam. Um, I just very much found myself attracted to that way of life. And that's exactly why when I came back to Ireland uh, in my mid twenties, I decided, right, well, the career for me is horticulture. This is clearly something that I have a passion for. So what do you do as curator then, um, uh, Dara? Like what's, what's your day to day? Well, my responsibility is I, I curate the living collections. Um, so we have in and around 15,000 plants growing in the ground here in the gardens. Uh, and my job is to, well, ensure that those plants are um, at their horticultural best. So that when the visitor comes, they're seeing a garden and the landscapes looking uh, at their best. That's one element. The other side is to ensure that the collections represent um, conservation collections. So for example, the Encephalartus woodii, we're, we're not just a, a normal park. Our collections are very, very specialist. So I must ensure that everything is uh, named correctly. So working with Colin and the guys in the herbarium, we, we make sure that things are labeled correctly, named correctly, um, and that our collections are always expanding and developing and, and that we're um, relevant to conservation issues around the world. So do you I go, manage a lot of that. 
do you go out and look for new plants to add to the collection or or, or does that happen so much anymore because 15,000 is a lot of plants to already look after but are there new species or new plants that you think oh that would be great for the Irish public to see uh, oh absolutely I mean those 15,000 plants you must remember a lot of those plants, many of those plants that we have are here a long time some of the trees are well in excess of 100 years and many of them are will reach the end of their natural life so we always have to update collections we will lose plants for in any in any given year you can lose collections for various reasons there are our own irish native area in the garden where we have showcasing various habitats and threatened plants of threatened plants from ireland is something that has continually been developed and added to so collecting plants within ireland and overseas um, is something that we we very much do and it is a a key role of a botanic garden to do this. How do the plants in the, the gardens contribute to science, um, Darren? Well, there are many, many reasons. On the very uh, basic level, the sort of fundamentals of, of botanical science is the classification of plants. So having plants here, like Colin mentioned, in the herbarium, where we have dry specimens and have living collections is a very, very valuable resource for people who are studying plants internationally. I found out recently we have two species of a, of a genus called Berberus, which are nowhere else in cultivation. Now for us, we've been growing this plants for a long time, but we didn't realize the significance of some of the plants we had in the collection. Um, so they exist nowhere else. We are able then to provide that material to other gardens to safeguard those individuals. Um, and and that's, that's, that's sort of fundamental to, to, to what we're doing. Uh, Colin, um, tell me a little bit about your career. How did you end up becoming a botanist? Uh, so it was actually kind of a bit uh, by default. I, I, I'm fascinated by natural history in general. Uh, and then when I was studying science, um, I, uh, I think when it was going from second to third year or something, we had to dissect a pigeon. And that was a little bit too far for me. So I just went with the plant. Uh, and so ever since, I just, uh, but then, okay, I went on and did my PhD, or whatever, but uh, just plants are, Absolutely fascinating. There's th there was this thing that I heard, I think, very early on in, in lectures was called totipotency. And it's a, it, it sounds like a lovely big word as well, but it's this ability of plants to just change their, their cell, essentially. So that's why you can basically cut a piece off a plant and stick it in the ground. And it'll grow new roots where there were no roots before. And there's just an amazing uh, plasticity in plants. And they just do, they're totally different to animals. And they're totally different. They don't talk back to you. Loads of various things. Like that. <laughs> um, some of them do, Colin. Some of them do. <laughs> some, some of them do. <laughs> but they're, I just find them absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a question for you, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but uh, tell me a little bit about um, the curation of the sort of the dead zoo of plants, okay. because your, your job sort of reminds me of the the Natural History Museum uh, versus the, you know, the zoo, you're looking after these sort of dead specimens. Exactly, exactly. So I'm the keeper of the, the dead collection of plants. So we have 600,000 specimens. Um, and so these are some specimens uh, in the background here. So you see, they're all just squashed flat. We have some uh, as well that we have in spirit collections. Uh, so we have 600,000 of these. And two of the big projects that we're, we're undertaking at the moment, uh, one is digitizing it, which is an enormous job. So basically, we still don't know exactly all the 600,000. We have rough ideas of what we have. So over the next few years, we're going to be digitizing all of those specimens. And we're starting initially with the Irish collection, which is about 100,000. Uh, and that will be then hopefully freely available. The people can look up what's in there, what uh, was collected in the 1800s in the local field and how it has changed over time. And another really important project Dara mentioned about uh, collections and I think you mentioned seed. So we're, we're uh, one of the big things as well is we're setting up a national seed bank. So it's for wild uh, species. There are seed banks for, uh, for agricultural crops and crop wild relatives, um, but this will be just for wild species. So there are two sort of interesting things. Technical question for you, Colin. Is there a cost to deposit an herbarium sample for plant researchers? Official herbarium deposits are becoming a prerequisite for submission of research for many plant journals, says somebody. Uh, no, there's no cost at all. Uh, all I would say is if you have a lot 
uh, it can sometimes get uh, take us time to process them. But no, we we get that we get specimens in all the time. We give you a um, an accession number, and then you can use that in publications. You kind of touched a little bit on um, the the potential for um, understanding how plants change over time. Um, is there a realistic um, likelihood that this sort of knowledge will help us uh, make more sustainable um, uh, horticulture in Ireland and a more sustainable environment, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's already been used uh, as a... Um, as a link for uh, for climate change. So looking at these little stomata, which are these air holes on, on the mainly on the base of leaves, um, uh, we're looking back at herbarium specimens from you know, pre-industrial uh, times to now, and you can see the change over time. So it, it's, it's, it's a great reference and a tool to sort of, uh, to infer change and in how plants adapt. And then yes, we can use that to, predict into the future as CO2 goes up, what, what will potentially happen? So uh, definitely it, it is uh, very useful for that. Again, the physical specimen is so key because yeah. we could have just a record of like, th these are willows up in, up in the mountains. We have a record of them, but to have the actual willow that we can look at the back of it and look at the, the, um, the specimen interrogated under microscope. And then, as I said, extract DNA out of it to look at changes over time. That's absolutely massive. The physical specimen is huge, really. Um, uh, Jonathan, can I just, just yeah, add to that yeah. um, an important point that uh, I, at the COP26 meeting, um, the Botanic Garden, International Botanic Garden community has just uh, launched a, a tree standard. And what that is about is that, you, I'm sure everyone is aware that many countries have made these pledges to plant one million trees or 10 yeah. million trees, but there's a real anxiety that many of the trees they're selecting are not at all suitable for the local area. Many will die, many will have negative impacts on the water table, you know, basically planting trees without considering it. So the Botanic Garden community has, has recognized this and has come together to try and standardize that the trees that are being selected are appropriate are not gonna have a, a deleterious effect on the landscape. So again, the, the, the science of, of botany and horticulture are absolutely key in driving that standardization. Um, a couple of quick questions for you. Keep them coming. For you, Dara, is there any way of members of the public can volunteer to help out the Botanic Gardens? We don't. We, we Unfortunately, we, we don't have a volunteer program uh, on the grounds of the nope. garden. Grant? Um, be, yeah, for, I, I would imagine for good reasons, although you can't say it. <laughs> you don't want people <laughs> botching up your, your precious plants. Um, and then uh, another question for Dara. Um, it's from uh, East, East, uh, a transition year horticulture class. We have set aside a part of our school grounds about a football pitch size, wow, um, yeah. to allow it to rewild itself. Any advice on how we should manage this? I mean, if you're rewilding it, is it just don't manage it or, or what? Yeah, I mean, um, I would suggest that it, 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 a lot depends on, on the, what's existing on the site or what, there at the moment and what's around it. But um, I would suggest mowing. The mowing regime is most important. If you, if you just simply stop mowing and leave your mowing until the, let's say, September, when all of the flowers have flowered and the seeds have fallen, mow it and then remove that grass, that's about as much as you really have to do. I mean, some people ad advocate adding in seed mixes, but I would have a, a, a word of caution about that because, you know, there is a lot of controversy at the moment about seed mixes having alien species in or potentially invasive species. So right. really what you want to do is harvest the local seed material and spread that on the land and leave it, just leave it be. Okay, so, but, but why do you need to mow it at all? Well, because it becomes very rank. You, you, you just need to keep it down. Uh, yeah. If you mow it, the most important, when you mow it, you must remove the hay because it, it, you want to remove the nutrients. Ideally, what you want to do is keep reducing and reducing the level of nitrogen in the soil so that the grasses don't become very competitive. This okay. is one of the big problems, um, restoring landscapes. Very good. Um, Lael, uh, I was really interested to see your research. Maybe you might tell me a little bit about um, your uh, career and how you ended up working at Chagask and maybe a little bit about your research, please. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. So um, I was very interested in biology in school and in sciences in general, but particularly biology. And that led me to study a, a degree in science and a master's in science. And I worked internationally as an environmental scientist for about eight years 
including for the World Conservation Union, which is headquartered in Switzerland. And then after that, I decided to change track a little bit um, with the PhD in crop protection. And really a PhD is just an intense period of research where you focus on, on you know, answering essentially one important question or research question over a longer period of time. So getting very in depth with, uh, with research. And when I finished that, I went on to a further period of research called the postdoctoral position at Lancaster University in the UK. That was in horticulture. And I was very lucky then to see the job come up at Chagisk, and that role is focused on sustainable horticulture. So essentially combining my previous studies in environmental science with this knowledge I have on crop production and horticulture. And I now lead a research program while I'm trying to get it up and running. It's, I've been there for about a year and a half in sustainable horticulture. And that spans a whole host of different things. And I can talk more about some of the, the research that we're doing. Um, so one of the projects I work on is helping horticulture producers move away from petrochemical based plastic films. And this is quite important. Um, you know, right now, as Dara mentioned, COP26 is going on. There's a lot of attention on carbon and fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions. And the idea there is we're trying to trial or to get um, incorporate the use of starch based or biofilms. So these are renewable resources in terms of um, in terms of plastic types of films, but it's not so easy to transition away, away from petrochemical films. These uh, original petrochemical plastic films are very good at maintaining the environment of our fruit and veg, and that means they can last a long time. When we purchase them in the shop, they can last in our fridge up to five or seven days. But if we transition very quickly to these starch-based or biological-based films, these are biological entities themselves, and they have an interaction with the crop they may cause an increase, they may sustain respiration of the crop after harvest. That means it spoils very quickly and you might find your crop only lasts two or three days and that leads to a buildup of waste in, in, in your home or waste of your food. So we're trying to figure out the science behind transitioning to the use of these films. And that's a really exciting project, if, you know, if we, can, if we can support that because I think this is what consumers are asking for. They're, they're tired of these single use plastics in their food and it would be great to offer a more sustainable uh, film solution to, to food packaging. Absolutely. And, and salad is the number one waste product in Ireland um, when it comes to food uh, because it spoils so quickly. Um, and I've, won I've always been wondering why we haven't started using these biofilms that we see for other products, but it's because these... Um, these leaves or these plants keep breathing once they've been harvested and, and that breathing is a problem with, with interacting with the biofilm. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it leads to reductions in the, in the weight of the food. It leads to spoilage. Um, and if we can start to take interventions in the way we grow the crops um, and strengthen them in certain ways and reduce that rate of respiration after we harvest the crop, we think this will help us transition to these more sustainable types of films. And if we can get that right, bio-based films are excellent because they may be compostable. So in, any, in a sense, you know, you, you can put that into your compost bin as opposed to, you know, other types of bins. And we can start to manage our waste more sustainably, including in a home environment as well. A couple uh, of questions for you from our audience. Keep them coming in the Q&A section underneath this video. Uh, is it possible to do a PhD in horticulture? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned in the video the Walsh Scholarship Program. This is a period of training um, supported by Chagisk and supported by my department as well. And we offer PhD projects um, every year. So it's worth just checking out the website or writing in to myself or my colleagues to inquire about opportunities. Um, so check out the Walsh Scholarship Scheme. It's on our website in Chagisk or contact me as well to see what's, what's up and coming mention what your interest is and we can try and find the right project for you as well. These are competitive projects. So, you know, you'd need to go through an application process, but there's, there's loads of opportunities and we'd encourage people to get involved in, in research and horticulture. Yeah, lots of information on courses or you can call the college. Uh, but the website is chagisk.ie. Another question for you, Lael, um, and I'm not, not quite sure um, what, what, what they mean. Maybe you might. Shane Halpin from Wellgrow Produce says, is there any research on cucumber producing going on in Ashdown? Um, there may well be, not directly in, in the research I'm involved in, um, but Shane, you know, we can chat about it maybe offline and I can chat to my colleagues to get back to you with some of the work we have going on there. Nothing that I know of or I'm involved with directly myself. Yeah. 
Okay, keep your questions coming to us and uh, we'll get to as many as we can, as you say. Sam, um, maybe you might tell me a little bit about your research because I was really interested to hear that we're looking at genetic diversity in trees. And I know this is stupid, but I assumed that there wasn't a huge amount of diversity within tree species. But is that the case? Are, are there some trees that are extremely diverse in, in, in the wild and some not so much? Yeah, so that's a good question, Jonathan. Um, so, well, first of all, the project that I'm working on, so uh, it's a t it's a two year project funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And um, basically the aim is to assess the levels of standing genetic diversity uh, in our most important native tree species. So what I've been doing is traveling around the country to uh, the, the last few pockets of native woodland sites that we have left in Ireland, because of course we have the, one of the lowest uh, native forestry cover in uh, levels of forestry cover in Europe. Mm. Uh, and so what I'm doing there is collecting leaves, as it was explained in the video, extracting DNA, uh, and then trying to build up a picture about how genetically diverse uh, our native trees are and our forests are. So um, yeah, you would think that generally speaking, um, trees would have a low level of genetic diversity uh, because they all kind of look the same. But actually, every individual tree is genetically different from, they're all genetically different from each other, just in the same way that we're all genetically different from each other. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So um, some trees, they, they uh, reproduce clonally. So uh, which is to say that, they, that they're actually identical. So a really famous uh, example of that is the uh, big quaking aspen forest in um, in Utah, uh, and so it's it, it, it it's actually 108 acres in size, but it's actually one individual tree all connected by the one root system. Wow. And so if I was to go and sample those trees, I find that they actually are all identical. But generally speaking, every single tree uh, uh, that, like say for oak and birch, etc all genetically different to some degree, um, but it's not as simple as that, uh, I would say. When it comes to sustainability, I mean, uh, you, you talk about a, a, a tree that is, um, you know, a clone of, of all of the other trees around it. You know, that seems to me like a, a real potential target for some sort of disease or some sort of danger. We look at the ash here in Ireland. Um, when you're, you know, sampling the, genetic diversity of these trees are you hoping to find some trees are more resistant to disease or pathogens like like ash for example is it, is it possible you might find an individual that might be way more resistant and and we might be able to do something with that yeah so it, actually ash is a really good uh, tree to, to kind of uh, elaborate on why we want to study genetic diversity uh, so ash dieback as you mentioned uh, arrived in Ireland, uh, or it was first detected in Ireland in 2012. But you speak to anybody uh, that's, that, that lives in a rural area, a farmer, whoever, they'll tell you that all the ash trees around them are dying. And that's because ash, is, uh, ash dieback is, is spread so rapidly all across the country. Mm. Um, but it is, uh, so So in, in my work, I've been sampling ash. Uh, we sampled nearly 400 trees uh, and the vast majority majority of them uh, have canopies that are completely decimated. So there's only a few leaves left and they're all withered and black. But there are some, a very small minority that are actually uh, fine. Uh, and so we take note of this. And so once we've extracted the DNA in the lab and do our uh, analysis and analyze diversity, we can, we can say, oh, hold on a second, that genetic cluster there matches with this uh, group of trees, which is actually resistant to dieback, uh, and so yeah, that's uh, that that's that's basically what we're hoping to find that there will be a, an outlier genetic group which will be resistant. And um, but yeah, just to say, so far, genetic diversity for ash compared to other trees in Ireland se seems to be relatively low, which right. isn't surprising because. Uh, Obviously, ash dieback is everywhere. Yeah, uh, but we 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 we're still kind of it's it's kind of uh, still ongoing research, but we'll find out very soon. Um, so yeah. 
Dara, um, question for you in terms of seed bank and seeds conservation at the botanical gardens. Is, I suppose a few years later, seeds undergo great dormancy so much that they cannot be revived again. How does a seed curator um, or researcher ensure that the seeds remain viable for longer years? I haven't thought about that. Um, well, there's there's a number of types of seeds. You have you have standard seeds or um, uh, orthodox seeds and recalcitrant seeds. And orthodox seeds are the majority. And most orthodox seeds, if you when you collect the seed uh, and you clean it, if you if you reduce the internal moisture level down to about fifteen percent, uh, so that it's, it's, it's almost entirely dried out, and then freeze it at a low temperature, most seeds will stay viable for for many many years, decades if not hundreds of years. Um, so right. it, it is it is a fairly uh, well practiced method. Now there are there are species from certain from certain uh, are certain seeds from certain species that that just won't work for. But majority will remain viable. Um, is it hard to maintain the environments for uh, all the different um, types of plants that you have there, or um, or or have you seen that, for example, extreme weather events have had an effect on your living collection? Yeah, like uh, as I mentioned, like some of the collections are quite old. So particularly in trees where trees begin to to go into the latter stage of their life, the wind, their limbs can become weak and so on. So with, with increased storminess, you will expect to have limbs falling. Now, we because we're such a, a, a relatively small site with a huge visitor numbers, we have to be very careful uh, about trees uh, with damaged limbs. So. If there's a, a threat at all about a tree coming down, it is we have to physically remove it before that happens. But we will always ensure that it's um, replanted. One of the other things that uh, there's a species just outside my office here. It's a, it's a beautiful tree from China. Um, it's probably here close to 100 years, um, but it's never really flowered before. But for the last four years, it's been flowering. Now that we don't know exactly why, but it's probably to do with the increased temperatures over the summer. So this may be an indicator of the, the sort of slow march of, of climate change and the increased temperatures. Certainly the same species in France and in Central Europe has actually become uh, almost invasive uh, now. So we may be looking at uh, situations like that in the future with our collections. Colin, you mentioned a seed bank um, and, and that uh, this is sort of wild seed. How does this compare to something like um, Svalbard in, in Norway? Um, so it's it's kind of a bit different to Svalbard. Svalbard is uh, uh, just it's it's for a start it's stuck into an ice uh, an ice mountain which we don't have. Uh, so physically it's very different. We have freezers, so we have minus twenty freezers. So that that last question that Dara was answering, um, whoever asked that question, I think we better give them a job. They really are spot on in 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 you know highlighting the problem of storing seed. You just need to get it dry. Uh, and then stored in, in freezers. But Svalbard, the other thing, not only is it physically different, it's, uh, it, its focus is different. So it focuses on uh, crops. So we're uh, focusing on uh, all wild species. So it's, it's actually not crops. Uh, so, um, but even the, like the, just the example of using Svalbard, generally Svalbard is for just depositing specimen or seed and leaving them there. It's called a doomsday vault. So that eventually we might need to go to it. We hopefully won't, but uh, in fact, they have utilized seed already from it uh, for, um, for Syria. I think they, they basically had to go where there was just war, uh, dis had destroyed areas and destroyed crops. And they went and asked for the seed to come back out to uh, uh, to repatriate it and to reuse it. Uh, for for our um, the wild seed, we we could potentially use it for um, reintroductions. Again, if we have an issue where we some habitat is destroyed, we could potentially use it for reintroducing species. Um, but hopefully, it doesn't come to that, mm. and we just start using it as a store. And, and like the herbarium, in 200 years ago, people didn't know they were going to extract uh, DNA out of herbaria in the 2000s. Uh, you know, the same with seed banks. We might be using them for a totally different use in, in the future. Uh, you, you mentioned some of the plants that you had that are now uh, sort of at least extinct from the area that, from where they were uh, harvested. I'm wondering, 
do you have many plans that don't uh, that don't exist anywhere in Ireland in in that um, bank? And how far back does that collection go? So the collection goes back to really the 1800s. The, the earliest we have is 1660s, wow. but really, really most of it is from the 1800s on. Um, and yes, we do have specimens. I, I, I don't, I won't show you the actual specimen because uh, I'll wreck it. But uh, this is just a photo, photocopy of a specimen that was because if basically if I tilt it up like that, it'll fall off. But uh, this is this is a specimen. It's okay. It just looks like a, uh, it's a sedge. It's not very attractive in any way. But that's a specimen that is extinct in the wild, and. It was found in actually the director here uh, back in, I think it was the 1850s, no, 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 1900s. So basically they, he found this plant and was wondering what is this sedge? And he was able to identify it as the extinct plant by looking at the herbarium specimen. So it just shows you again, the physical specimen was used then to, to, um, to show that something has gone extinct in the wild. And now we have a whole uh, collection of it. Uh, growing now because it's it's uh, although it's extinct and why we have it in collection but in an add-on to extinct um plants is not only do we have extinct plants we do have plants that are extinct uh, uh, in the wild but the uh, herbaria are turning into uh new discovery areas they're basically uh, one of our staff has just come back from paris uh working on a genus like plants related to clove and he's found new species in the Paris herbarium. Mm. Same with here. We will have new species that have not been discovered. So say in the 1700s, 1800s, we're battling out into the, into the wild to discover all these new species. We can just, I, I can walk two minutes to uh, these compactors, open up and potentially get new species that have not been uh, properly um, discovered or de described. So is, that, it, is it possible that some of these plants might have medicinal properties that we weren't aware of, or are they are, are most of the species very similar to the sort of species we already have and we know what what use they are? Absolutely, they will. They will have medicinal uses. Uh, that would be a, a whole other tangent, but absolutely. Say I was on a, a, a sort of excursion expedition to Honduras there back in 2016, and we found a new species that is related to uh, coffee. And so it could have, because coffee has all these uh, secondary compounds, this could equally have other secondary compounds that could be used. So, yeah. John, a question for you. Um, it's quite specific, again, about sort of um, advancing. It's about uh, how you go from level seven in horticulture WIT to level seven or, or to level eight or postgrad in biodiversity or sustainability. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, we get a lot of queries from students about advancing and progressing through the uh, the training uh, uh, strata that we have. And people people generally come to, to learn about horticulture here in Chagask in the National Botanic Gardens, and they might start at level five, which is a certificate level, very basic level of entry, but it's a one year program. Um, they might advance then to level six, advanced certificate, and they might specialize in that level six in a nursery, they might do food, they might do sports turf or indeed landscaping. Then there's an option to go on to the WIT, which is Waterford Institute of Technology, uh, our partner institute uh, with Chagas and, and WIT, and they might do a level seven, which is a bachelor of science degree in horticulture. And that brings together the, the science, the commercial nature of horticulture and the business nature of horticulture. Now, once a, uh, once a student has that under their belt, they have got quite a degree of uh, practical science-based horticulture and business horticulture. And the options then to move on might be to through, through to the botany department in TCD or indeed uh, to UCD to do the level eight program. And after that, as Lael has described, the sky's the limit. Uh, Chagask offers uh, Walsh fellowships, which bring people up to level level nine and level 10, and they can specialize depending on uh, the opportunities that are available there. But say, for example, Sam, who would have been a, a graduate of our programs, uh, has found himself in, in his own position after coming through the, the, the ladder of education through Chagas and on onto TCD and beyond. So a good example of, of progression. Was it easy, Sam? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> 
It was easy for Sam. It was easy. Right, for I see. Okay, it was okay. easy for me. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It was a lot of hard work, yeah. but um, yeah. So just I suppose that if you if you I can give give an example of one uh uh part. So yeah, I did the level five certificate in horticulture, um, back in two thousand and twelve, I think it was. Uh, then I did the uh, level seven um uh, degree in horticultural science. From there, I went to UCD, did a, a master's in plant biology and biotech. Uh, then I did a PhD in the same subject. And now I'm here in the botanics and the herbarium doing a, a postdoc. So, um, yeah, that's 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 one uh, avenue, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you liked it. Uh, John, we're just going to finish up but very quickly. Someone um, was asking about the glass houses at the botanic gardens um, and any plans on um, restoring any of those glass houses. Well, that might oh, be sorry, a Dara, question sorry, that's for, for Dara. For Dara yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry, Dara. Dara, that's for you. Um, restoring the glass houses. Well, the, the, the Great Palm House and the Curvilinear Range were both restored around twenty years ago or so. That was they, they, they've been sitting for close to one hundred and fifty years, and we're in some state of disrepair. But they were uh, magnificently restored, um, so they won't be touched for a long time, and, and nor do they need to be. But the existing uh, water lily house and the old fern house beside it, which have, if anyone has been on site, there's been a hoarding around that for quite some time. There's a program now of renovation uh, underway, and we're we're discussing plans and design options with the architects. So that will mm. be happening in the next couple of years. Okay, uh, um, and very quickly, um, tell me a little bit about the courses for aspiring as, uh, horticulturists at the botanical gardens. I, I, I might just oh, take sorry, that John. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Please, please do, please do. <laughs> I'm just I, confusing I, John and Dara. No, you're okay. You're okay. And no, I mean, uh, I, I would say uh, I would direct a lot of traffic towards the Chagas website, uh, yeah. the Botanic Gardens page on the Chagas website. That's where we have our apply online uh, portal uh, where people can come online uh, basically from next week to look to do courses in horticulture. One of the things we did, Jonathan, in the last number of years to allow a bit more flexibility on programs because recognizing the fact that a lot of people that come into horticulture might be doing other other courses or other other fields of uh, uh, you know in, in their own in their own life but we can offer uh, short at uh, um, bespoke uh, courses that are qqi uh, validated um th in things like plant propagation plant identification uh, landscape construction and maintenance all of those are available. They're all on the Chagas website under the Botanic Gardens page. And um, we'd be happy to take any queries uh, from, from the public there. All right. Well, thanks very much to you, John. John Lohering, College Principal in the College of Amenity Horticulture. Uh, uh, Organisers Katrina Boyle, Siobhan Dermody, uh, Eileen Flynn, and all of our panellists. Uh, thanks very much to you. Um, the event was made possible by Science Foundation Ireland and Chagask. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Chagask uh, Science Week uh, continues. I'll be back here tomorrow from 11 a.m. for Sustainable, Nutritious and Delicious, what's new in fruit and veg. And you can register for this and find out more at chagask.ie. If you'd like to be in the chance for winning a 50 euro one for all voucher, please fill out the survey. Uh, we'd like to know what you made of the event. And one last thing, I'm sure you've heard ads for uh, the Creating Our Future initiative, which is a campaign by the government to try and uh, steer research over the next few years. Uh, we'd invite you to tell us what you would like Chagask and other agri-food researchers to look at and examine uh, over the next few years. You can do so by going to creatingourfuture.ie. I will see you back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Have a great science week. Thank you.